In this video, I'd like to derive an expression for the linear acceleration of an object as it rolls without slipping down an inclined plane. So I've drawn an object here on an inclined plane, and we'll say uh, that relative to the horizontal, this inclined plane is at an angle theta. We're going to define the positive x direction to be down the ramp and the positive y direction to be perpendicular up and away from the ramp. And now we're going to draw in some uh, forces that are acting on this object. So first we know that acting at the center of mass of this object, the gravitational force pulls straight down, and I'll label that mg. So we'll say we're saying that this object has a mass capital letter M. There's a normal force that is exerted at the contact point between the object and the surface, and that point's perpendicular to the plane. I'll label that N. And then there's a frictional force that occurs at that same contact point, which points opposite the uh, direction of the motion of the rolling object. And so if the object is rolling down the ramp, then the frictional force points up the ramp. And this is a static frictional force. Once again, what I said that I wanted to determine was the linear acceleration of this rolling object as it goes down. And so we're trying to find the acceleration of the center of mass, which I'll call A here. Uh, and we need to differentiate between that acceleration and the angular acceleration alpha because as this object rolls down the inclined plane, it's going to be picking up speed, but its angular speed is also going to be increasing, and so we'll have an angular acceleration alpha as well. For the translational motion of this object as it goes down the inclined plane, I can use Newton's second law. Newton's second law says that the net force acting on the object in the x direction which is a vector, is equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration in the x direction. The forces that act on the object in the x direction are the static friction force, which is negative, it points up the ramp, and then a component of the gravitational force. If you remember, the gravitational force can be broken down into the uh, components that are perpendicular to the ramp, which would be mg cosine theta, and the component that points parallel to the ramp, which points down the ramp, which is mg sine theta. And here that would be positive based on the coordinate system that I've shown. And so here I'll write mg sine theta, the component of the gravitational force that points down the ramp, which is positive, minus the frictional force, fs, equals the mass of the object times its linear acceleration. Next, I'd like to write Newton's second law for the rotation of the object. So the net torque is equal to I times alpha. And so we need to figure out which forces are causing a torque on this rotating object. First, I'd like to point out that if the axis of rotation is the center of the object, then we should say that the gravitational force, mg, does not exert a torque on the object. The reason is that gravitational force is exerted at the axis of rotation, and so it can't cause a torque. Similarly, the normal force, while it's not exerted at the axis of rotation, it's exerted along the direction toward the axis of rotation. That normal force is exerted at the contact point near the surface, but it points toward the axis of rotation, and so the angle between the moment arm, or r, in my torque equation and the force will be zero, and the sine of zero is zero, and so for that reason the normal force also does not exert a torque. The only force that exerts a torque on this rotating object which causes its rotation is the static friction force. And so I'll write uh, for this torque Fs, and then I will say that the distance from that um, force, uh, which is a, at the surface, at the edge of the object, to the center of mass, which is the center of the object, is going to be capital letter R. And so I'm saying that the radius of this object is R. Okay, 
Okay, so the torque is force times distance, and because the frictional force and the distance from where that force is exerted to the axis of rotation are perpendicular to one another, they're 90 degrees apart, then uh, the sine of 90 degrees will be 1, and so for my torque equation, I just have Fs times R. On the right-hand side of the equation, I'm going to just leave this uh, as... I for some generic moment of inertia for any type of object that could be rotating down this inclined plane times alpha, where the uh, direction of the angular acceleration is positive, so I'll leave alpha as positive. So now I have an equation that describes the translational motion, an equation that describes the rotational motion, and I'll need one more equation in order to combine these and solve for the linear acceleration to obtain the expression that I want because there's uh, one more unknown that I would like to get rid of and that is alpha. And the way that I'll get rid of alpha is by saying that the linear, the linear acceleration A is related to the angular acceleration through the radius of the object. So A equals R times alpha. And so for my, my first substitution, I'll plug in my expression for alpha into the equation in yellow. So alpha is equal to A divided by R. And so plugging that in here, I'll get that Fs times R equals I times A over R. And the next step is I'm going to solve my translational motion equation for the static friction force, which would be Fs equals mg sine theta minus ma, and I'll substitute that expression into the blue equation, which was my equation for the rotational motion of the object. So combining those two equations, I get mg sine theta minus ma times r equals the moment of inertia times A over R. And my end goal here is to take this equation and solve for the linear acceleration. So the first thing I'll do is two steps. I'm going to multiply both sides by R to get rid of the fraction on the right, and then I'm going to distribute what will now be R squared into both terms on the left-hand side. So I'll have mg R squared sine theta minus mar squared equals i times a. Next, I would like to have both terms with the acceleration on the same side. And so I'll have mar squared plus i times alpha equals mg r squared sine theta. Now lastly, I, I'd like to factor out the linear acceleration and then divide by all of the stuff that's left over to move it over to the other side. So if I factor out the A, I'll have A equals mg r squared sine theta. And then we need to think, what would I be dividing by on the left-hand side if I factored out the A? In the first term, I would have left an mr squared. And in the second term, I would have an I. And although we could stop there, um, so far we've been doing a bunch of math, but the, the real meaning behind what we're trying to do here can be seen if we just go a couple steps further. What I'd like to do then is I want to factor out and cancel the MR squared term. And the way that I can do that is if I rewrite this as A equals M R squared times G sine theta. So nothing changed on the top yet. I just rearranged it a little bit. Then on the bottom, if I want to factor out an M R squared from both terms, I can write this as M R squared. And then if I were to distribute that mr squared back into the two terms on the bottom, we need to end up with the same thing that we had on the bottom left part of the screen. And so when I distribute an mr squared back into the first term, all I need there is a 1. And if I distribute the mr squared back into the second term, well, there wasn't an mr squared there to begin with. 
And so I need to have what I had originally divided by mr squared. And that might be kind of weird. You might not have seen that done before. But let's look at this. The equation that I just wrote, just the denominator, if you, if you redistribute that mr squared back in, you would get mr squared times 1, which is mr squared for the first term. And then in the second term, you would have an mr squared on the top and mr squared on the bottom, which would cancel, leaving you with just i. And so the reason that I've done that now is because now this mr squared on top and bottom will cancel. And ultimately, this leaves us with the equation that I wanted to obtain. a equals g sine theta divided by 1 plus i divided by mr squared. And so now what I'd like to do is take this equation and see what we can learn about objects as they're rolling down inclined planes. Some of you are probably looking at the equation and saying that that's kind of nasty looking, but I think when you actually try to take an object and analyze what its acceleration is, you'll find that uh, the answer we get is quite simple. So for example, we've seen the case uh, where we see a hoop and a disc rolling down an inclined plane. And what we know, you know, if you, if you think of those two objects, we have a hoop where most of its mass is distributed, you know, a certain distance away from the axis of rotation. It has a moment of inertia which is given by just mr squared. There's no leading term, it's just mr squared. And then for a disk, you know, which has maybe for the same amount of mass and radius, it has its mass distributed uniformly throughout from the axis of rotation all the way out to its outer edge. Its moment of inertia is lower because it has some of its mass closer to the axis of rotation, so we should expect a lower value. The moment of inertia of a disk with mass m and radius r is one half mr squared. And so already we should be able to say, well, the moment of inertia is less, and so it should have a higher acceleration and it'll get down the ramp quicker. But what is the acceleration of each one of these objects? We should be able to see already that a lot of simplification will occur. So first we'll look at the acceleration of the hoop. For the hoop, we'll have g sine theta on the top. Notice how, you know, if we take these two objects and we roll them down the same inclined plane, you know, g is the same for both, and the angle theta will be the same. And then in the denominator, we'll have 1 plus, the moment of inertia is mr squared, and on the bottom we have mr squared. So for the hoop, those two terms will cancel. We'll have mr squared divided by mr squared, which is equal to 1. And in the denominator, we'll have 1 plus 1, which is 2. And so my equation is 1 half g sine theta. And now for the disk. The acceleration of the disk is, once again, g sine theta on the top. If it's on the same inclined plane, then the numerator uh, is going to be the same. And then in the denominator, we have 1 half mr squared. And so it's 1 plus the moment of inertia is 1 half mr squared divided by mr squared. Once again, the mr squareds cancel, but instead of 1 plus 1 in the denominator, I have 1 plus 1 half. And so that is 3 halves, or the final result being 2 thirds times g times sine theta. And so here, you know, while we were able to conceptually talk about why the disk should win going down the plane, here we have, you know, a formula which can tell us here's the acceleration and here's why it's greater. So using that derivation, we can get this pretty important equation, which won't be given to you in any uh, you know, situations, but as long as you know how to get there, you should be able to show that for cases like this, you know, the disk will have an acceleration that is two-thirds g sine theta, but the hoop is just one-half g sine theta. And so for that reason, if the disk has a greater acceleration, it should get down the ramp more quickly. Another very important result that comes out of this is, you know, if you have, you know, a big box of different disks, they all have different masses and radii, but they're all disks. They have uniformly distributed mass uh, around objects like this. Then they all have a moment of inertia of one half mr squared, and the m's and the r's always cancel. So the final acceleration, two-thirds g sine theta, doesn't depend on the mass or the radius of the disk. So you should have, you should be able to have different uh, disks with different masses at the top of the inclined plane, and they would reach the bottom at the same 
amount of time because uh, they have the same acceleration. Same thing for the hoops. If you have hoops with different masses or different radii or different masses and radii, it doesn't matter because for any particular hoop, uh, the, the M and R cancels out and the acceleration is still going to be one half G sine theta. A very important relationship.